Let me start by uh, thanking Perry for her very generous uh, suggestion that I have some responsibility for NEABPD, an organization which uh, has had enormous and still growing influence in the country by uh, making available conferences like this which uh, broaden everybody's awareness and uh, uh, depth of information about this disorder that we're all uh, concerned about. I'm uh, the last person on the program. I'm aware that that means that uh, you've already been inundated with a lot of information and probably looking forward to a Saturday afternoon elsewhere. And uh, um, what I would welcome is um, some interaction during the course of this discussion lending itself and leading into a more open discussion. I think partly with that in mind, Perry suggested I take on some broad title. I kept throw, lobbing out uh, more specific things. And she said, well, you're at the end, you know, just the diagnosis and then, you know, say what you want to say. And uh, uh, so you get a sort of a hodgepodge. And, in fact, when I looked at the slides I'd set in, they didn't really make a great deal of sense. That there were replications and there was no obvious order to it. That had to do with the fact that at the time that I was sending these in, my secretary and I were engaged in a battle oh, over preparing new slides and what numbers. And she'd enter one and I'd be working off one copy and she'd... So anyway. So there's some coherence to uh, the slides that are in front of you and what uh, I'll use to guide the talk, but uh, forgive the inconsistencies. Um, this was a <laughs> uh, one of the uh, most recent losses in this morning when I was changing the order of the slides. Uh, much of the content of this one disappeared. Uh, um, and you probably can't read it. <laughs> uh, what it says is historical trends in the borderline construct. And it starts out by saying that the construct began as a form of personality organization, um, really derivative from uh, Kernberg and other psychoanalytic uh, thinkers, uh, where our classification system at the time, the whole classification system, was very primitive. And the discussions in a uh, field of psychiatry and mental health, which was dominated by psychoanalytic paradigm, had to do with whether people were psychotic or neurotic. There were no normals. Uh, and uh, then there is this group that was, didn't fit into either of those categories. And so borderline personality organization was posited as one of three major forms of personality organization. And if you think, start thinking epidemiologically, I mean, that would cover a huge sector of the general population. Um, what uh, brought the borderline construct in, uh, to attention was the idea that a severe and uh, a group of people with personality disorders uh, were potentially treatable. And, uh, of course, at the time, the hope was that very intensive, long-term, heroic treatments, uh, which were enormously expensive and where it was really not something that anybody could do anyplace other than in major academic centers, um, um, could bring about some kind of curative change. And that impelled a whole lot of uh, enthusiasm by a generation of... Uh, clinicians that uh, would not otherwise have uh, ever brought this disorder uh, into the attention it gets now. That was followed by um, some effort to define the syndrome. Roy Grinker, who was at the time the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Chicago, did perhaps the, the, the first and most uh, pioneering effort. And that was followed by the work that I did that um, actually started to identify criteria which differentiated these people from other groups of people, and that in turn led to its adoption in DSM-3 in 1980. And uh, with its adoption within the official nomenclature, a large number of empirical studies 
Oh, <laughs> well, so these, there are additions to this one, but they're probably still unreadable, so we'll, here we go, we'll move on. Um, this uh, reflects the uh, remarkable growth in uh, both clinical and research reports about borderline personality disorder. And uh, uh, these were all sort of what I would now call first-generation research. Mary made reference to those, some of those which had to do with longitudinal course, which were, had lots of dropouts and were methodologically weak. And that was true of almost all the research which was done. And uh, it is uh, refreshing and quite remarkable to hear accounts like Mary's and uh, Pat Cohen's earlier today about the depth and uh, uh, precision of modern research uh, and the degree of integrity and believability about the results uh, that was unmatched by this early generation. Amongst the major findings that have come out of the research, uh, I'd like to highlight two. One is the one you just heard about by Mary. Um, her findings about the overall course of borderline personality disorder took place against the context of this. There had been a number of studies, this is one by Mike Stone, which suggested over a long time borderline patients got better, but that it was a very stormy course. The most and more notable thing about this is, is I think like a 10, 12 year course. And um, now we know that the, the rate of recovery is frequently much more rapid than that. Uh, this is a, uh, another uh, prospective longitudinal study, which uh, the, the collaborative longitudinal study, uh, which Mary was also part of, which just simply highlights what she was talking about, the rapid decline in the number of symptoms over even the first few years. The second major, I think, change in our understanding of borderline construct came from the identification in 2001 about the fact that borderline personality disorder has significant heritability. Just as it was sort of assumed for a long time that borderline patients was a stable disorder intractable to treatment, it was also assumed that borderline personality disorder was largely, if not exclusively, the result of environmental causes. So the idea that when Sven Turgesson and his group suggested there was a very high heritability to this really has called for a very different understanding of this psychopathology. Um, the uh, comments earlier this morning um, by uh, Scott Wilson, I think, uh, are reflective of a new generation of and a new type of research which is, uh, promises to have very long-term uh, effects uh, that follow up from this finding. In the meantime, we're left with the idea that borderline psychopathology has significant heritability and uh, what is it that's inherited? Um, uh, one of the prospects is that there may be something about the inherent neurocognitive wiring of borderline patients, which something like splitting, which we've always thought of, thought of as an interpersonal phenomena, might be reduced to something that's genetic. On a more um, descriptive level, uh, the general understanding of borderline psychopathology is that it's divided into three major sectors of psychopathology, each of which can be understood as phenotypes, meaning the sub-syndromal phenomenology of the disorder, which has significant heritability. And that's, this way, the affective characteristics uh, of borderline patients, the readiness to become angry, anxious, or to shift between anxiety and depression, which are specifically the aspects of their affective liability that uh, are most uh, characteristic of borderlines, may have an underlying genetic basis for it. Uh, a second phenotype is their impulsivity or behavioral dysregulation. 
here, their, ability, their tendency to act without concerns for long-term consequences, and maybe specifically their behavioral specialty of self-injurious behavior may have a significant heritable component. And the work that Scott Wilson uh, described earlier this morning underwrites that possibility. Um, and thirdly, and this is the area that I'll dwell on a little bit more, is that the interpersonal characteristics of borderline patients may have a heritable basis. This really flies in the face of most psychological and psych certainly psychodynamic thinking about borderline patients because this is an arena that has always been thought of as something that has been environmentally created and perhaps environmentally amenable as opposed to something that for which there might be some um, genetic um, underpinning. Uh, this slide I won't dwell on. It's simply a little more information about the impulsive phenotype. I had a, another slide that was supposed to be here on the affective in phenotype, but neither of those are central to what I want to talk about. And since I, the affective phenotype is missing from my slide collection, I'll just slide over this one. <laughs> Uh, uh, this uh, gets closer to what I wanted to talk about, uh, which is that um, when you begin to think that the interpersonal characteristics of borderline patients uh, may have a genetic uh, basis, this is supported by uh, a, sort of a long line of research, which I knew nothing about, which indicates things like um, uh, uh, interpersonal warmth uh, may have a significant heritable component. Um, even in the work that uh, comes out of academic psychology about personality traits like um, uh, agreeableness, uh, that has a significant heritability to it. Um, within the realm of borderline personality disorder, uh, there's been a lot of concern about the early attachment experience of these people, and most of the emphasis has been in the attachment literature as well as in the uh, standard psychoanalytic uh, literature, that there has been something very dysfunctional in the early parenting of people who grow up to be borderline personality disorder. If you turn that on its head and take a, a become more aware of the degree to which the parenting experiences are conditioned by the nature of the child, things which have been hinted at by several of the speakers earlier today, uh, you begin to see something that is far more interactive. And this slide something captures about it. If you have an infant, for instance, who is unusually easily distressed and maybe particularly sensitive to the interpersonal interactions with their caretaker, they are more apt to have distressed responses to Let's start with normal caretaking experiences that involve frustrations and disappointments and hunger or uh, needing attention, but that their responses are more distressed to those normal things than uh, another child's. Uh, at that point, um, if you have a distressed response by the caretaker, it's going to aggravate that child's uh, predisposition and they will become more distressed and more fearful. A distress-prone mother, caretaker, will is likely to respond with anger or withdrawal. Uh, and uh, what happens then is the attachment to the caretaker becomes what's called disorganized. Disorganized attachments, I think I have a slide. Oops. Here we go. Our contradictory and unintegrated behaviors towards care comfort, caregivers when comfort is needed. Um, the slide says this occurs in the first year in about 15% of infants. It's identifiable actually by six months. I think it's 5%, but it may be 15% of infants have this. It is associated, this comes out of a literature not specifically related to borderline, but looking at early attachment experiences between infants and their caretakers. Um, with hostile and helpless caretaker behaviors, 
And this gives way to controlling strategy by six years. And what some of these children who have uh, disorganized attachments to their caretakers uh, then go on to uh, form either caretaking relationships with the, the caretaker so that they become parentified, something which I think in Mary's work she identified about 30% of the histories, <laughs> childhood histories of people with borderline personality disorder. And it is an, actually an adaptive way for children who have disturbed caretaking experiences to stay in touch with and keep their caretaker alive. So within the realm of sort of um, Darwinian adaptation is an actually a very uh, a resourceful adaptation made when you have uh, caretakers who have uh, problems. Uh, I was thinking of that this morning when Pat Cohen talked about the fact that a significant number of the children who at five years old had had, who be, went on to develop borderline problems, had had um, severe separation experiences from their caretakers in the first five years of life. And that, a, interestingly, it was not simply the separations that she said, it was separations which were, where there might have been some attribution of will on the part of the parent, as opposed to those which are due to medical illnesses. So that there was a certain, which takes you into the meaning attached to the separation as much as just the separation itself. In any way, you can imagine a child with a parent who is absent for any reason becoming a caretaker for such a parent. And it's an adaptive way to keep that caretaker alive and keep them involved. And maybe one of the pathways which lead to later borderline personality. Another way which might be more comfortably familiar with uh, adult clini uh, clinicians of adult borderline patients is that they can become quite punitive towards their parents and become a, a sort of hold them hostage, a pattern that you can see evident when they get into the adolescent early adult years where you see parents who are uh, intimidated by the threat that their child is going to either misbehave or kill themselves or overeat or undereat or um, go out all night or whatever it is, and they become uh, held hostage by these threats of the child. That also is an outcome which is predictable by these early disorganized attachments. To go back to my overall thesis is that there may be issues within early development which set the stage for later development of borderline personality disorder, and that those, those uh, interactions are twofold. The child helps create the parenting as much as the parenting creates the, the child. And the pre-borderline child, it's posited, has an innate hypersensitivity that shape the early caretaking and predisposing to make later interpersonal stressors particularly traumatic to them. One of the issues with parents are that they may often bring the, the, the standard literature about parenting has always been that the parents are creating the child. And uh, I know when we raised our children, we always felt responsible for shaping them. And unfortunately, I think that we were imposing too much responsibility on us for their outcomes and not enough, we weren't sufficiently aware about how the child, the, the children differed in what they needed. And uh, in fact, our responses to them appropriately should have been more and should be shaped by, as much by what the child's particular needs are. And this is a, I think, good paradigm for use clinically that to talk to parents about the fact that they have a child, borderline adult, who should be seen as a special needs child, the, the sorts of responses that might have been, uh, you may have been raised by and proud of, and or that might work with other children, need to be modified, that these are children who some of these instinctive uh, responses uh, 
that you b might value highly can be harmful for. Uh, some examples of that are, these are children, young adults, adults, who is generally not a good idea to give you-can-do-it reassurances to. With, so that uh, offspring is borderline, they'll hear that as you're, mean, you're saying that uh, I'm responsible for not having done it, that you underestimate, don't understand how hard this is for me. And so it's a basically well-meaning, well-intentioned response that might be good for many other people, but when you're dealing with a borderline offspring, it's not a good thing. It's just another vignette along those lines with the borderline patients often said to cause splitting, and uh, we heard an example earlier today about how uh, that may be something that the borderline person participates in, but it takes an environment to create the splits. So with parents, you know, it is not unusual for parents to be somewhat divided in their roles. Typically, but not always, the male is the person who, ha you know, sets the rules and reinforces them. The uh, mother is the person who does the nurturing and the uh, uh, reassuring. When you have a borderline offspring, those are things which are generally fine in most families and work out well for raising children. Uh, can be the um, soil which is very fertile for creating splits and where the, those same characteristics can bring about acrimony within the family and uh, that is uh, very harmful uh, both for the, the parents and for the child. So we would counsel parents in general when they have a borderline offspring before they respond to the demands, requests, uh, behaviors of their borderline offspring, they talk to each other. And they reach some consensus about what they both agree. It doesn't really make any difference whether the answer is going to be yes, no, or something in between, but that it come from both of them so that there's not inconsistencies between them. Because inconsistencies in the parents are very uh, fertile soil for them to uh, develop their uh, psychopathology. If the uh, father is usually the one who says no, let the mother say no. If the um, mother's the, usually the one to say yes, let the father say yes. Uh, so these are very directive, explicit types of customizing the home environment uh, to uh, diminish borderline psychopathology. I'm not sure what my next slide is going to be, so, okay. Uh, in the background of what I'm saying is my own bias in the direction of understanding borderline psychopathology. I feel that while uh, the case could be made as, I think, uh, DBT um, uh, proponents uh, would, that emotional dysregulation is the core psychopathology and there's much that can be said for that. Uh, the argument can also be made that the behavioral discontrol is just as core and maybe more important. I would think that the um, interpersonal hypersensitivity or the arena of interpersonal relationships is where the core psychopathology of borderline personality disorder is. The affective phenotype helps explain the comorbidity uh, with mood disorders and maybe especially bipolar disorder. I was very interested in Pat Cohen's data along that line. Um, the impulse uh, phenotype helps explain the overlap with substance abuse, bulimia, uh, and antisocial uh, uh, behaviors. But the interpersonal phenotype is the arena I think that most distinguishes borderline patients which makes them so identifiable and why they are so unforgettable both within the family lives of, uh, that they come from and within the treatment context where we see them. They are uh, very interpersonally intense, charged, demanding, and interesting and uh, uh, evoke all of our hatred and rescue um, uh, efforts at the same time. I want to 
turn now to some issues that surround the borderline diagnosis. One is the fact that most clinicians are reluctant to convey the diagnosis to patients. There are many reasons for that, not the least of which is reimbursement. If you identify the person as bipolar 2, which is now the most, in Boston, the most common diagnosis, but that has followed upon PTSD or major depression as being the leading diagnosis, there's some reimbursement that you can count on as clinicians by giving those diagnoses. They also reimburse for sort of more limited types of treatments, which uh, are not likely to do justice to or be very specific to um, borderline patients. In any event, many clinicians, the only, uh, <clears throat> well, the study that I know best is one out of Rhode Island outpatient clinic where only one out of 40 borderline patients actually had the diagnosis identified in their charts. I think clinicians often recognize the diagnosis much more than one out of 40, but they're hesitant to put it into the official records that uh, surround it because of reimbursement reasons. There are other reasons too, which is that if you give some other diagnosis, particularly an axis one mood di dis disorder diagnosis, you have a treatment which is relatively easily done and uh, which is more upbeat in its tone. You got this problem, I've got a solution. Doctor feels good, patient feels hopeful. Medications generally don't work very well. Uh, when they don't do it very well, what you see is what Mary described is that the, multi the medications multiply. Borderline patients are not so much a problem with compliance as with their, their eagerness to find a solution that is that simple and the gratitude they have for a doctor who offers that kind of hope. So the doctor gets intoxicated alongside with the patient by the hope that medications are going to do something the medications multiply, the patient gets worse, not better. On some level, there's more despair on the part of the patient and their family because the treatment which had, they had counted on isn't working. And then, of course, the worst tragedy is what Mary just described with the polypharmacy and those patients who don't get better, and there is an interactive effect. It's not like the medications caused it. The proliferation of medications is symptomatic of the fact that the patient wasn't getting better and symptomatic of a problem in the mental health field where there was not a willingness or an ability to step back and say, treatments aren't working. So medications, if they have a role, it should be empirically tested. You know, we, this might work. If it isn't, let's take it, uh, uh, discontinue it and try something else. And specifically, borderline patients and their families should be told that the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. There are only a few instances where another diagnosis should trump it. I think, for example, people with substance abuse need to have, be sober and be, have some uh, stability in their sobriety before their borderline personality disorder can be treated. But that's really the only clear exception. Um, I would also, and maybe it doesn't need to be said, but people who are psychotic with bipolar 1 or uh, uh, that also would trump it. But in the arena where we oftentimes actually make our decisions, like if somebody has bipolar 2, that ought not to trump bi uh, borderline personality disorder. Bipolar 2 um, is equally ambiguous in terms of its responsiveness to medications and particularly mood stabilizers. And yet, that's a perfect example of how the cycle of expectations and um, uh, can get uh, linked to a psychopharmacological treatment where even the clinician who knows about the treatment of bipolar II would want to anchor their uh, comments about the use of mood stabilizers. If with bipolar II, you can't expect the results are very unpredictable. They're partial and sometimes not very good at all. That does not mean that borderline personality and bipolar II are not linked. They are, but they are linked in this way too, that there's an ambiguous and partial response to medications. In contrast, what we now know about if you understand borderline personality disorder and 
offer the diagnosis to patients and their families, the prognosis changes dramatically. One of the reasons why this diagnosis has such a bad name is that for the first 15 to 20 years in which it was used, the only literature about it in the treatment arena was psychoanalytic, and what they did is not document successes. They documented how hard the people were to treat. And partly they were so hard to treat because they were retreated with something that was iatrogenic. It made them worse. And uh, we're still getting over that. And the mental health field in general has not turned around its attitude about understanding that this is a good prognosis diagnosis. It is a co with a complex, significant heritability behind it in its etiology and where the uh, treatments are available which uh, can, uh, uh, are very optimistic in their effectiveness. Um, I think Jim Payne, maybe Perry, I don't know how much has been said about the uh, initiative this last year when the Congress passed a resolution. Um, has that been discussed? I wasn't here yesterday, I'm sorry to say. but It's a uh, remarkable development where the United States government uh, takes an initiative which should have arisen within the mental health field um, to say that we, our country, our people, need to be more aware of a disorder which is highly prevalent uh, in our society, very destructive to family life, very costly in public health terms, very under uh, recognized and underdiagnosed and often mistreated or um, uh, worse, uh, made worse. And um, uh, this initiative should have arisen within the mental health field. Indeed, I think we're going to have to be dragged by our bootstraps back into an uh, awareness and a sort of treatment attitude that is uh, responsive and respectful of these patients' needs. The American Psychiatric Association in this coming spring is going to uh, give a nod in that direction by um, uh, identifying a significant part of the scientific program or dedicating it to uh, the kinds of research you heard about this morning. The American Psychiatric Association's primary journal, the American Journal of Psychiatry, is going to dedicate the May journal to uh, articles about this and to improve uh, awareness. Um, that is uh, a start in that direction. Um, all of you who are part of the mental health community here in Minnesota can do a lot locally in terms of uh, advocacy and uh, publicity for a disorder that you're here because you're interested in, but you're also aware is often underdiagnosed and certainly your treatment efforts are hazard, there's hazards to your reimbursement for them. So with that overview, I'll uh, close and we can have an open discussion. Thank you very much. I'll uh, start by responding to a question that was asked earlier this morning that uh, Perry passed on to me. It's a tough question. It has to do with the effects of sexual abuse. And are there differences in the effects of sexual abuse if it is uh, from an insider, that is, a member of a family, as opposed to an outsider? Well, the answer is yes, but that's not a very informative answer. Uh, it's complex. When it, 
When it is from someone within the family, it is harder to process. It is harder to discuss with outside people because of the dangers to one's own safety if it's, uh, and because of the sense of betrayal of the, the family member that's associated with that. Uh, if it's done by a sibling, which is not unusual, uh, the pre-borderline child uh, will be, uh, if the pre-borderline child has a relationship with their parents where they can talk about this, the toxic effects of it are likely to be minimal. But that's not an easy family situation to have where you run the risk that the sexual abuse by a, a male sibling, I'm I, that's the arena I know it most frequently, um, is often an older brother and it occurs because the parents are often not around very much. So it takes place in a context where the child is likely to feel it's dangerous to tell the, the parents and also the connection and the communications between that child and the parents may be already somewhat limited. So that's a nucleus, a, a, a kind of um, uh, circumstance where it's likely to be uh, quite harmful. In other instances where it is, for instance, between a father or a uh, Dutch uncle, you know, somebody who otherwise they have a kindly relationship with, it is also difficult for that to get communicated or talked about outside and can, may come up in a therapy later in life. And it's complex there because they love the person and may have felt loved by the person. And the meaning of it is very difficult to sort out. And the effects are not nearly so severe. When you have uh, uh, sexual abuse which is done outside the family, once again, the major prognostic issue has to do with whether it can get talked about or not. The ones who become borderline with histories of sexual abuse are those who did not have an opportunity or for whatever reasons having to do with their innate dispositions, did not process it at the time that it happened. Children with sexual abuse or any other kind of abuse who have the opportunity or take advantage of opportunities to process it, talk about it, are much less at risk for the development of both borderline personality disorder or any of the other forms of adult psychopathology which can follow from such abuse experiences. It's not just borderline personality disorder. Sexual abuse is linked to a borderline personality disorder, but that is partly the idea that in clinical samples, most borderlines are female, so that the sexual abuse is more frequent in female offspring and female children than it is male children. And it's a little hard to sort that out, but it, it is a risk factor without question, but it takes, its, takes place alongside of issues such as uh, physical abuse. And I think Mary and I have had this talk. Uh, um, the emotional abuse may be the most devastating of all because uh, uh, when it comes within the families and uh, harder to sort out, it's harder to come to terms with that. It's not the events. It has to do with the... Uh, attributions of badness. Hokey doke. You mentioned that a child's parenting is partly formed by the child's vulnerability. Did you know that in a, a twin study by Kendler that uh, parental warmth towards the child was more determined by the child than by the parent? I always thought, you know, as a parent, I grew up, you know, the standard that we all learn is that you love all your children equally, you know, and they're, everyone's equal before parents, you know. Um, well, it's not true. Uh, parents love their children different, differently, different, and qualitatively and quantitatively. And that, so parental warmth towards a child is determined more by the child than by the parent. Not that they're not both important, but it isn't simply something that every mother will love every child equally. 
Some children are more lovable than others, and um, uh, some are less, and uh, that, Im that has its effects on parenting. So here, do you think that this is partly explains why parents of borderline children are often stigmatized as inadequate parents by professionals who claim the opposite, that is, the parenting that forms a child? There's no question about it that we as a society, certainly even in the mental health fields where we should know better, have always thought that parents shape the children, and we never really, it's news to me in the last five years, and I hear that there's some, I have come across a literature out of scientific, a scientific literature that supports this, but I never learned this, never, as a parent or as a clinician, that parents, that children help shape the parents. So, compounding the problem is what several people talked about this morning, is that the borderline patient typically is looking for an explanation as to why they're failed. And the parents are very obvious and in some ways easy objects for that blaming. So it is, and that's nicely documented some years ago, you know, borderline patients blame their parents more than any other patient group. Simple enough truth, those of us who are clinicians are very familiar with that. The problem is that we used to believe it. We certainly excluded families from it rather than seeing some kind of participatory in interaction there and seeing the, the degree to which the borderline patient blames their parents as a defensive way of avoiding some kind of accountability and responsibility for their own fate. Did you mention that, Mary? Anyways, I know we agree. I, just, I heard it earlier today. So. Um, do you think that nature may be stronger than nurture? When you talk about heritability, um, uh, you're talking about group means. And um, when, I, when I first uh, became aware of this, I was in the schizophrenia area and uh, you know the news that it was genetic was newsworthy and important. But I learned from somebody who is much more of a geneticist, you know, all, what you have is group means. What that means is that some people with schizophrenia, which is more heritable than borderline and most heritable of all psychiatric disorders, some people you're going to have 90% of the variants accounted for by their genes. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to have some schizophrenic patients where the heritability that accounts for their illness is going to be down something like 30%. And then you're going to have some people where it's 100%. You're talking about group means when you get into heritability. With borderline personality disorder, I believe that's particularly apt because um, if you just took 60%, that means that some people are going to be 75% inherited and there's uh, limitations maybe about what uh, social learning experiences can do. And you're going to have other people who are 30% and they may be particularly uh, both caused by environmental things and more responsive to um, environmental uh, types of treatments, or meaning interpersonal or psychosocial interventions. There is vari variation within the borderline um, about these things. And uh, I know, enough. I put all these cards down here. <laughs> because of the interaction in breastfeeding, it can change the model of attachments in infants. Could this have an impact? Yes, it could have an impact on BPD. We don't really know that much about early attachments. I, what I was talking about in terms of disorganized attachments is a particular pathological form of attachment which is identifiable early in life. That, I think, has little to do with breastfeeding or not. My daughter is breastfeeding a baby at present, and she thinks she's doing God's work. Uh, and, uh, I, and you surely don't want to interpose yourself in that kind of communion. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so. On the other hand, you know, many, many children, including myself, I think, were raised without breastfeeding, and, uh, you know, you can come out all right without it. So I think it has some small degree, it might account for some small amount of the variance, but I wouldn't see it as something that...
it's going to cause or prevent borderline personality disorder. Also, eye contact and touch with infants is important. Well, this gets into something that I think is closer to what we what are modern thinking about um, early development and the de and Peter Fonagay, who isn't here, but his uh, partner uh, Anthony Bateman spoke to you yesterday. Um, that the beauty about mentalization-based treatment is that it has, to some extent, certainly to more than any other treatment that I know of, uh, a, a basis in de uh, developmental observations about mothers and children, and so that the what is proposed within the treatment is meant to be corrective for early caretaking interactions without saying that it's a bad parent or but you have a child special needs so let's just go back to that model you have a child who is very sensitive if you have a mother who's sensitive a very nice quality in many respects might be a bad parent for that child you might want somebody who's sort of very placid and not very reactive. Might be a bad mother for some other child, but a good mother for this child. Um, um, the issue in mentalization is that the parent fails to be responsive enough to labeling, helping the child identify their feeling states and providing the language for it, and aware enough and providing the language for them to understand how the mother and why the mother's reacting to them. I'm using mother, but it's the caretaker. And that's the model on which mentalization-based treatment is, that you don't know. And so the, the, you're always asking the patient, the borderline patient, to articulate what they think is going on in them. Well, I don't know. Well, stop. Can you identify what you're feeling? Well, I feel some tension in my forearm, you know, or, hmm, what does that mean? And it's beginning to help them develop a language for understanding that tension might be anger or that something else might be fear. And they'll, what they'll, many borderline patients will say is, I'm upset, I'm very upset. But they can't articulate what it is, that they're angry, they're sad, they're frightened, there's some combination of that. Their emotional experiences are often inchoate. Which is sort of what I liked about what Mary talked about, sort of a chronic dysphoria as being the, you know, it's a unpleasant negative feeling states which don't have a whole lot of definition. And what analyzation based treatment attempts to do is to get that person to be able to differentiate and articulate what those feelings are and to read what's going on in you instead of misattributing schema focus there. Anyway, there's other therapies that do this too, but rather than misattributing, well, I know that you're angry, and not talking about it. saying that they think that's what's going on, and then having some kind of corrective uh, interaction about it. It's not that the therapist is non-disclosing. It's important what the person is thinking. A great deal of premium is placed on what the pa patient, the borderline patient, uh, proxy for that small child, uh, learns to identify their mental states and how they affect you and how you affect them. So yes, I think things like that, the eye contact and touch and things are important ideologically. Is that enough? No, I thought maybe in a minute or two we'll find out the percentages. Is it enough? Your, your call. I'm fine. <laughs> several years ago, Medicare identified several diagnoses as medically untreatable. Huh. Borderline personality disorder was one of those diagnoses. I didn't know that. It lasted a few months and then was judged untreatable diagnosis. How can we prevent insurance companies from arbitrarily determining what diagnoses are treatable? Really, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I go into my office. Uh, I treat patients, I do research, uh, and uh, Perry might be able to answer that much better than I don't really, I'm, this, it's sort of new to me to get into the social, political realm of uh, 
uh, psychiatry, mental health. Um, I didn't know this was true. Maybe Alan? 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 So, so, so in that case, is it DBT or you're talking about effectiveness in your hands at your site? Um, that's encouraging. Um, yes. Um, for example, if you want to know more about that stuff, like if you go to PubMed, they have information. Like for example, um, they determined based on the evidence that DBT is appropriate for treating borderline personality, but not enough evidence for treating other illnesses. So, for example, stigma would be okay with someone who's treating borderline personality disorder, but they would expect it to be treating DBT. So, if you want to use the so. So if you're using one of the other empirically validated treatments, could you cite the evidence in favor of it or? It was a, a question I think maybe directed more at Alan Facetti than me. But, uh, I'll field the questions, all right? <laughs> As the best role when you don't know. I have an expert on that. Um, so I, I'd, I'd ask the qu question as to whether if you're providing some other empirically validated treatment uh, other than DBT, whether the insurance companies would be responsive to uh, your citing the literature in favor of its effectiveness. That, that's my impression, absolutely. It's not that it's DBT per se, but that it's empirically. I've had this experience also in treating families sometimes. Doing family treatment is notoriously non-reimbursable. Yes. Um, but if you can show that, for example, there's a literature that you can treat depression effectively by doing good couples work, if you can, sh if you've, I've had good experiences in our clinic getting insurance companies to go along with that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> data, we, data are we pretty powerful We have viewed family today. interventions as uh, one of those non-reimbursable uh, costs which we have to swallow by, uh, you know, off the overhead or uh, from philanthropy. Yeah. Um, other questions? Um, Barry, do you want to the first one of those better than I can? Uh, I don't know how to answer the transmission of family systems. Uh, uh, Barry, uh, do you want to take a shot at it? And then, oh. The first one, I believe, was is there a transmission of family systems from one generation to the next? I don't know of any um, actual data, but it seems that that would be so. For example, um, I worked at a Mass General Community Clinic for years uh, while I was a graduate student and the parents were young enough that their children started coming in with BPD and they were seemingly developing the same exact kinds of relationships with their boyfriends or husbands so that uh, it does seem to be true but I think it would be an important area for future research. No. Yeah. We, we've recently done some work looking at the attachment of borderline, you know, the 
their prototypic attachment type, and then seeing whether it related to the attachment type of their parents. It wasn't very uh, reassuring. What we had hoped was, you know, that the borderline has a preoccupied, fearful form of attachment, meaning they're very needy and very frightened, and it's a it's a unusual uh, and seemingly contradictory combination of uh, interpersonal things. We were hoping we'd see that in the parents, uh, but it didn't get borne out. Now, the methodology isn't great, but nonetheless, we were disappointed because we would have liked to have seen that kind of uh, linear transmission. You know, the second question you asked about uh, the accuracy of our ability to report what we do, it turns out that, that Tolstoy was right about that. Tolstoy said all happy families are alike, but unhappy families are unhappy each in their own way, uh, huh. which I take as a corollary for research, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and in reality, that, that's what we see. We, we've done a, actually a couple of studies on this. There are some others out in the literature. For example, what we found was that uh, families, uh, we looked at couples separately from parents and children, but in both cases, if they were relatively happy, uh, relatively well-functioning, well their self-reports corresponded rather well to our blind observer reports and other indices. Uh, but that if they weren't, uh, that actually there was very low, much increasingly low correspondence. Uh, our, our understanding of that is that the more conflict there is, the more arousal there is, the more arousal there is, the, the poorer our descriptive memory. So. Uh, and we then tend to interpret things instead of describe them, and then interpretations run amok. So um, I, that's a, it's a, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what we found. Uh, and there are actually other studies in the literature that show some fairly similar things. Let me uh, 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 parse out the questions so that we try to get everybody involved here. Uh, this one I think is best for you, Scott. Is, are there studies indicating whether DNA changes from generation to generation? Um, okay. Um, not the one over. Well, um, we know a lot about how uh, we know how DNA is transmitted, and uh, we know that how it can change. Generally, um, it, it's a, a complicated subject, but generally DNA uh, stays in it's approximately the same form when it's transmitted uh, through reproduction. Uh, there can be mutations, like some of the things I talked about today are specific kinds of mutations, and there, there's many others. Um, but very often, these mutations uh, just disappear because a, a huge majority of mutations actually tend to, be, uh, to end up being lethal mutations, so the, the cells die. So a lot of mutations just kind of disappear. Sometimes mutations persist because they, they're not lethal or they might have some gain of function, and so that can happen. Um, but in general, DNA take pretty much stays in the same form. Uh, so there, there can be modifications to things like uh, gene expression, and that's one, what I was referring to when, uh, when one of the questions after my talk, and, and that was through uh, methylation, what I mentioned. Th and that basically is something, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a post-reproduction uh, modeling that happens in the context of different experience, and it, it basically turns genes on and genes off, and this can happen throughout the, the lifespan. But, but it doesn't actually um, change the DNA in its physical form. So uh, did, I, did that answer the question? Uh, here's a question uh, for O, and Dr. Cohen, Dr. Zanarini, and Dr. Frizzetti. <laughs> uh, is there a relationship of the sibling's place in, uh, in the family to BPD? I suppose the question is first, second, third born, or that sort of thing. I'll do a, a quick uh, answer on that. That's a question we could address easily in this study, but never thought of. <laughs> <laughs> This is a question we thought of, analyzed, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to Mary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a question for you, Pat. Uh, when you talk about significant separation in the first five years of life, having some relationship to subsequent BPD, what does significant separation mean? Just plain separations for any reason 
of over a month duration. And actually, the, the duration of the duration tends to be related to more than one kind of problem. Uh, here's a question for Dr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Frizzetti, and Dr. Zanarini. Uh, you talk about the effects of abuse. What about the effects of neglect? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and, and I think uh, increasingly uh, people are starting to think that maybe neglect might actually be uh, the real problematic issue here uh, and because it's something that we would, would be associated with abuse, but also in other situations where there might not be abuse. We're, we're st we, we don't have uh, data on that yet, but we're, we're collecting it now. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on that as far oh. as our results go. But, uh, but I know a lot of people are thinking about it. Yeah. Of course, th the difficulty is that you have patient uh, reports on those things. And that's, uh, we have actually records of uh, child abuse and neglect. Uh, but um, I have not, I don't recall <laughs> what our findings are with regard to borderline disorder as such. Um, you, yeah. you want to talk but about there is a review of that literature that um, uh, Jeffrey Johnson and my group uh, has done. Um, uh, and if you look up his name, you will find <laughs> out where. Um, in studies of borderline patients, neglect is as common as abuse. And by neglect, I don't mean physical neglect. By and large, more subtle things like parents were inconsistent or parents withdrew because they were depressed, something along those lines. Um, lines that actually strongly indicate the issues of attachment that Dr. Gunderson and others have talked about. In our analytic work, what we've noticed is that um, the constellation of childhood factors most predictive of BPD, and this was an inpatient sample, so it may well be different in other samples, was non-caretaker sexual abuse, somebody other than a father, backed up by both of the parents being seen by the child as, quote unquote, neglectful. And if you think about it, they would tend to go together. It isn't that one family's wildly abusive and another's neglectful. If they're truly chaotic and having trouble functioning, they may well uh, be both. Yeah, I, I would just add to that uh, that from the trauma <coughs> literature, this is quite consistent with what you're saying, that uh, the, the biggest predictor of negative long-term consequences of trauma isn't the trauma itself but how parents respond to the disclosure of the trauma. In my language, if they're more validating, it mitigates the effects of the trauma. And if they're invalidating, like, don't you dare say that, you know, I'll wash your mouth out with soap kind of stuff, that exacerbates the, uh, the effects of the trauma so that, it, in fact, it is more of an emotional. I, I, when we talk about neglect, we're not talking about failure to feed and clothe children. We're talking about emotional neglect. That, that does seem to be actually a predominant factor. There's a series of questions that have to do with availability of treatment. Um, and uh, some of them are pretty specific, but they all uh, relate to a more general issue, which is that given that there are treatments which are developed that uh, have been shown to be effective for borderline patients, uh, can you find them locally? And if not, what do you do? Um, uh, one interesting variation on that theme is if you have an adolescent with borderline personality disorder and DBT is not offered or any other specialized uh, treatment, how would you start? What would you suggest? Alan, do you want to start that? Sure, I don't have a good answer for this, um, but clearly um, there, there are a number of options. I mean. In the long term, and again, given that, that sometimes the, the problems associated with, with this go on for a long time, uh, long term is reasonable to think about, it's worth starting to, f to lobby your local community mental health center, your local clinicians, and actually being uh, organized in saying we want to have effective treatments available in our community. Uh, that obviously can't happen overnight, but if, if you don't start that, then those things won't be available two years from now. You may still be looking for services. Uh, 
Um, the the other, I guess, the other thing I would say the literature seems to suggest is um, that there is a, an effect for how do I say this? Um, I think this is a little bit what Ken Levy was saying, uh, Ken Silk was saying yesterday, and in terms of finding somebody who really uh, knows this population and likes to work with these people uh, is probably better than any generalist. Um, there are lots of clinicians who don't especially like working with people with BPD. Um, and so for heaven's sake, find somebody who likes to and, and, and regardless of what they're doing, uh, see if they have any, any, any track record that, that would be encouraging while continuing to lobby to, to get some, something with empirical support. It's a really tough situation. I, I don't mean to suggest that's an easy one. It's, it's a really hard one. I um, would add to that that I don't think that uh, clinicians should minimize the possible benefits that they can have on people with this disorder. Um, we heard longitudinal data both from Pat and Mary this morning that talks about this sort of overall progression and that oftentimes the role that clinicians have is facilitators. And um, one of the remarkable things that in the longitudinal study that I helped look at was that some people got better dramatically and it had, didn't have to do with any sustained treatment, but clinicians, none of them specialists in borderline personality disorder, had a dramatic effect by facilitating, encouraging some type of situational change getting people out of sort of chronically stressful situations, helping people put, find themselves in much more supportive situations. Uh, disclosures of secrets within families can have a dramatic long-term effects. So I wouldn't despair about the absence of BPD-specific treatments. If, on the other hand, you're doing something that is supportive and commonsensical and the patient either gets worse or doesn't get better, then, I, you know, you can lobby for uh, empirically validated treatments, but that's not likely to help that patient. You may want to refer the person to a tertiary facility that does specialty treatment. Uh, certainly, uh, we're that kind of service, and it's kind of impressive. It sort of goes against my grain, but it is true that people, even when they come from a distance, uh, can get better when they're treated uh, with, uh, by people, very important, who know and like borderlines. 70% of mental health professionals explicitly don't like working with borderline patients, and that's definitely a bad prognosis for treatment. So, yeah. Barry, did you want to add something about that? Okay. I have just something. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the focus of this round of our uh, data collection is on exactly that issue, whether, uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Whether changing an, uh, your environmental niches, including both employment, particularly employment and where and your living situation, uh, will uh, what ha effect that has on your level of symptoms, uh, and uh, we are anticipating some fairly substantial effects depending on uh, preliminary analysis. So, Pat, here's one. Uh, do you think children being put in daycare uh, might uh, create uh, traumatic separations that will beget more borderline personality later? No, I don't. Uh, I may I didn't do justice to that question, but I <laughs> so um, if a child is typically resistant to discussion of of emotions and relationships. Uh, is it better to avoid the bi borderline diagnosis with that person and speak in behavioral descriptive terms about struggles and stressors? Who would like to take a whack at that one? Uh, there was a slide in your talk about that, about changes, right? Response to the borderline diagnosis. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, but this, I think, has more to do with avoiding the borderline diagnosis because a child or adult doesn't like to talk about emotions and discussions. And if you, if you introduce the borderline diagnosis, you're telling them that they have a problem with emotions and relationships. Uh, I don't really, in, if that, insofar as I understand that, I think that 
like most other diagnoses, uh, you don't give or not give it or l label it or not label it based on what you think that how, whether the patient's going to like it or not. That may have to do with how you give the diagnosis. And but you want to give a diagnosis because of what it conveys about the sources of their problems and what it means in terms of their um, f uh, treatment and. So I wouldn't avoid the borderline diagnosis for that reason. Um, people vary in their response to being given the borderline diagnosis. It is rarely that it increases their shame or they may be ashamed to begin with. Oftentimes people feel very reassured to know that there are other people with the same sorts of difficulties. There's a body of literature that's relevant to it. They're especially pleased to know, actually in a study that we did, the group that was really enthusiastic about the diagnosis were people who had been given other diagnoses and failed in treatment. Because not only did they have a new breath of hope, they had some direction and they became very, they were very compliant with uh, treatment directives uh, that suggested that borderline personality disorder. Take somebody off the street who doesn't know they're borderline and doesn't uh, you know, uh, is resistant to treatment, I don't think giving the diagnosis does much except put a framework for them around their problems which that they can then come back to and that's not unusual what I've seen people, especially what, five, ten years ago when I was doing a lot of consultations who then come back a couple years later and I've been thinking about what you said and it really made me mad. Uh, but thank heavens, you know, like now I want treatment or I finally went and got treatment and something like that. Yes. Oh, I'm supposed to stay with these. I think Perry would prefer that. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, I'm we're doing pretty well, actually. Um, I should put these down when we're done with them. If there's any evolutionary. This is, I'm not sure I understand it, but it sounds important. Do you think there is any evolutionary displacement of genetic BPD traits? Traits that were once more helpful, but are now culturally, quotes, demoted, meaning that they are no longer as adaptive as they might have been in an earlier era. It's a very interesting question. Uh, certainly being uh, likable as an infant is probably very adaptive now and always has been and be, being very easily stressed as an infant has always probably been that maladaptive but I, I just will make a comment about that um, he, it, it's certainly possible I mean uh, re remember uh, some of the data that uh, Barbara Stanley presented about the uh, the uh, increase in in perception of the affects in the eyes. Remember the eye, uh, the, fa the mind in the eyes task, and how the borderline group actually was much more perceptive than the control group. Uh, it's it's certainly not unreasonable to hypothesize that perhaps this did serve some purpose at some point. So uh, because this is essentially it's an it's a gain of of some function, right? Um, so it's hard to say, but you, you can certainly see how it could be the case. And, and there may certainly be other things, too, that we just haven't really figured out yet. I mean, this is something that we're just figuring out now. Even though P clinicians have been talking about this for a long time, I mean, borderline patients are very, very sensitive, and they can always know what you're thinking. Well, you know, it looks to actually be the case. Research is kind of bearing that out, so it's possible. There's a... I, Pushback in diagnosing children and teens with borderline personality disorder will occur from primary care providers as well as insurance. Pushback, I think the, this is a statement that a pushback will occur from primary care providers as well as insurance. They'll oppose it. Is that what that means? What are strategies you recommend to gain their support, primary care providers and insurance? Uh, providers. I think they all need to read uh, Dr. Zanarini's work. <coughs> no, seriously, because I mean, it, it's it's this stigma that has to be reduced. People need to, through education, understand 
uh, the outcomes are what they are, not what people fear that they are. They also read the outcome literature. I mean, I still, you know, Reno, Nevada is not a big place, you know, and, and uh, I still bump into clinicians in town that I've been there for, you know, 15 years, and I still bump into people who say, BPD is untreatable. I say, oh my gosh, I've wasted the last 20 years of my life, you know. And, you know, that's not what the research literature bears out at all. So people need to be educated uh, about this. I, I think that there was a time not so long ago where there were no studies that told us that anything worked, but that now that time is now 20 years, so people need to catch up. Here's a couple of questions that have to do with the name borderline, uh, where it came from, and wouldn't we... Wouldn't we uh, be better off with a more accurate descriptive diagnosis? This is not uncommon. And uh, 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 Jim Brailing, who is uh, one of the champions in this area and the head of the NIMH division, which oversees what available funding there is, uh, raised this question not so long ago in a, in a phone conversation. And it's not a new question. It, um, one of the problems is that the term borderline has a certain familiarity. They wanted to change the name schizophrenia some years ago because it had a pejorative significance, but everybody called people schizophrenic because that's what they were familiar with. And so it never really happened. And I think that's something of the case with borderline personality disorder at this point also. In its defense, I would say that there are, we don't really have a great alternative. Um, I suppose you could say unstable personality disorder would be the most uh, neutral in terms of anything ideological. But you, as soon as you open that um, can of worms, people say, well, I want emotional dysregulation, or I want a ta uh, unstable attachment, or I want... Um, and we don't really know enough about the basic uh, ideology of this to name it in a way that's more uh, fundamentally sound and why, in some ways, the term borderline is not only apt, but um, maybe even sets the stage for uh, or demands or asks for us to get more fundamental understanding of this disorder. Uh, that's without any apologies for its integrity. We don't know anything about the basic underlying um, endophenotypes or mechanisms and, uh, of any major psychiatric illness. Borderline personality takes place alongside things like schizophrenia, in the sense with genes, and you got the outcome, and they know a lot more than we know, but really, fundamentally, we don't really know that much about the uh, origins of any of these disorders. And when we do, the nomenclature should change in accordance with that. But we're a ways away from that. And to change the diagnostic system without that knowledge seems to me somewhat capricious. And the term borderline itself almost begs for that. You know, it's a borderline what? Well, we don't know. Borderline, you know, was it schizophrenia originally, then it was borderline mood disorder, then it was borderline PTSD, and now it's back to bipolar disorder. And it isn't really defined by its spectrum relationship with anything else. It has its own sort of what Mary called integrity. Uh, but that doesn't mean that in 30 years the diagnosis should still exist. But it really does await and beg for much more knowledge about its uh, etiology and much more specificity about its treatment even. Um, well, actually, at this point, it can actually almost claim more specificity about its treatments than any other psychiatric disorder, with the exception of maybe bipolar disorder and lithium, which is a prototype which is hard to compete with. Um, I wonder whether it's going to go on axis one uh, in DSM-5, uh, there's good reason to advocate for it uh, because it will help the um, its legitimacy for reimbursement. I mean, that would be one strong argument that takes it out of personality, which is you know chronic, stable traits and across many different, but really recognize the fact that it is unstable and it is treatable. And it has a significant, it's not just all environmental, it's 
you know, it's a regular psychiatric illness like others, and I think uh, sets the stage for reimbursement uh, better than leaving it on access to. Yes. Um, actually, uh, I would be very interested in what you say about that, Dr. Cohen, because... Uh, about moving to a more dimensional... Yes. I think it's potentially useful to uh, include an axis that does have those personality dimensions as, as parts of it. But I think that there should that the personality disorder should be on the same axis as with the as the other psychiatric disorders. I think maybe uh, some shifting around so that there is some, um, you know, uh, grouping of them that is not unique but rather goes with the uh, currently axis one disorders that they're part of. I think. That's why I thought we thought it was really important to show that their levels of, of disability are the same. It's really important for the clinical researchers here to show that they can be treated successfully, and uh, there's just no excuse for that uh, uh, separation of these, mm -hmm. uh, and not just this disorder, but all of them. Uh, because uh, controversy uh, is makes for the most is the most entertaining thing that. Uh, for most people, I'm hoping Mary will offer an alternative view. <laughs> I think the argument between dimensional and categorical is a false one. Obviously, psychiatry is part of medicine, and in medicine, people talk about diagnoses in a categorical manner, but they treat them dimensionally, and I think it, there will be no problem if DSM-5 did this. I think. That's a medical idea of severity, but there is some push to actually have clinicians rate each of the normal personality traits found, for example, in an instrument like the NEO. And I don't know any clinician who is going to take the time to rate 180 personality traits um, or that it would be particularly useful. I wouldn't see it as an individualized diagnosis, but something that could inadvertently pathologize a lot of people. But I think categories are good for conversation and communication. I think severity ratings are very useful for treatment. Cancers are rated on severity ratings. There's no reason why BPD couldn't be as well. I was referring to uh, actually the major uh, big five dimensions that they uh, that I've heard most talk about, and I think the other axes of of the uh, DSM system, there are other ones like defense mechanisms. I always felt badly that it seems to me also a useful clinically, uh, uh, a useful uh, construct, and but it's almost never used. I yeah, gather absolutely. even even. Uh, uh, overall functional level is by no means a standard part of every assessment, I believe. And so other axes, uh, you know, could be there for people to use them. I also agree uh, that, that the diagnoses are mainly for deciding who's treatment worthy and have it nothing to do with any other reality, in my view. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, I'm, we're all done? I think we're at a time. All right. I want to thank our panel who jumped up here spontaneously. Thank them. I also want to thank all of you for coming, for staying this long. I want to thank Trish Woodward, who without her, this conference would not have happened, the halls for being here, and the CME office at the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Schultz and his staff for being so kind to host so much of this. Thank you. Thank you.